I will begin by simulating the disorienting, interrupted, this is about the body, the mind, the academy, the time, and the pain that autoethnographically explores the queer element of American culture, the one of current chronic pain and fatigue, specifically fibromyalgia, or FMS, and myalgia and simple myelitis, or MPCFS. I will end with a more organized discussion of what drove me to why I proposed a digital presentation, and what I asked, argued, and inferred throughout. This presentation may reference with the thick blood, needles, and semi nudity, ableist, sexist, and racist microaggressions, medical gaslighting, suicidal ideation, and acts of genocide. The link in the chat contains a transcript and video descriptions for this performance. My name is Vaishali Manivana, and I'm presenting on invisible pain, intensities, ocularity, language, and the medicalization of affect. It's how I'm supposed to begin, with a PowerPoint behind me instead of this, my own private pain. I am supposed to whittle my scholarship to sanitized safety, because who among us, myself included, wants to spend days refining their prose about pain if writing about painful things is want to invade the body? Who desires the painful work of reading it? of having to give it that long, hard look. Instead, I give you this. My name is Vaishali Manivanan, and depending on the doctor, the cause for fibromyalgia, a syndrome of unknown etiology characterized by chronic pain in the muscles and joints, tenderness at specific sites in the body, fatigue, and forgetfulness, is different. Psychological distress, lingering infection, autoimmune disease, after I am officially diagnosed in 2007 at the age of 24, my rheumatologist tells me that the onset of fibromyalgia as recognizably fibromyalgia might occur due to injury, latent virus reactivation, or intergenerational trauma and epigenic inheritance. I'm lucky. Pain is considered private, subjective, and unshareable. It only took me a year of medical gaslighting and a few thousand dollars to convince a rheumatologist of my suffering when on average, it takes young women like me a decade and a fortune. But during that year and since, everywhere I go, the wolves are at the gate. It's just that you can't hear them. How many of us have sat in darkened rooms like this, flirting with the edge, because we enter clinical spaces without traumatic skeletal injury on our x-ray, no adhesions on our CT scans, no abnormalities on our MRIs or ultra ultra ultrasounds, no wincing before the physician's eyes, we are haunted, seen by doctors who don't believe in ghosts, who fail to see us, and failing, deny us diagnoses, medications, referrals, who say, if you could walk here, you don't need painkillers like those, but you look so well, there can't be anything wrong. Symptoms like these are usually psychosomatic, you need to relax. Now you'd know if it was a chronic pain disorder, you'd be crying on the pain. You're smart and conventionally attractive, I'm sorry, no one will believe you. Some doctors view you one way and don't want to see anything else. You're too young to have that much pain. There's a reason we call it a wastebasket diagnosis, and that reason is that we are cheaper and easier to discard. If this was you, would you also face the most strategic response? Relying on the sovereign power of the empirical things of previous medical experts, endowed with scientific knowledge and institutional authority that I don't have? Here delivered the first of many specific clinicians, only to learn that I look too well for anything to be wrong with me. FMS and heavy CFS are not apparent disabilities that do not appear in lab work when I'm doing Zero negative, I always look well. Too often I choose honesty over strategy, even though there is no place in Euro-Western clinical assessment for an embodied metaphoric poetics of pain. My pain is never average. My pain is never below a six. What is it to be a zero or a one? What number is the pain of understanding every time I am confronted by a scale that zeros and ones exist and they are not me? Biomedical pain scales don't understand the irrelevance of zero to five for chronic pain patients. Instead, they problematically ignore the multiple dimensions of pain and categorize pain as easily quantifiable, rejecting attempts at complexity or nuanced explanation. Pain must be understood within a patient's particular sociocultural milieu the fact that pain scales privilege intensity in their classification system propels the logic of cure and encourages suspicion towards patients whose pain is endless and non-apparent. 
When my appendix ruptures in 2014, later becoming the impetus for this project, I'd lived with chronic pain and chronic fatigue for eight years. My pain is a black hole and no one believes me. My complaints are dismissed by doctor after doctor as a, quote, fibromyalgia flare-up. You know if it was your appendix, they say. The pain is so bad, you'd be non-functional. If you're walking and talking, you're fine. My whole life, I've been fine. I'm implicitly taught, locally in my house and collectively as a people, that Ilum Dummels withstand pain. Modern Western biomedicine asks, where does it hurt? Seeking an objective answer that yields a static and singular notion of disease identity and prognosis, uncomplicated by the patient's subjective analysis. But a more apt clinical question for Ilum Dummel chronic pain might be, what happens when you shut your eyes against a bloodletting? In striving to be insensate, the senses become heightened. If the human body absorbs and reflects the postmodern condition of the body politic, what does it mean that, for all the, those years, the contiguous Tamil homeland in Sri Lanka has been threatened in all its joints? Ruma, the flow or great fluxion throughout the body, renamed refugee, an ontological dislocation that finds its twin in chronic pain, similarly inexplicable and haunted, a haunting itself, a body imperceptibly and always on the run. I can't say any of this in Western clinics if I want to be believed, but internal displacement and dispossession mm. are not terrible metaphors for chronic pain and fatigue. Fibromyalgia has been described by patients and researchers as internal disorder, bodily chaos, contingency. <coughs> in some ways, the vicarious <coughs> secondary PTSD induced hypervigilance I never felt entitled to was good for the fibromyalgia. In some ways, by saying this, I go to say vulnerable oh. accusation. By lay people and clinicians who doubt the disease's validity, that I did this to myself. I am always making Karna's mistake before the final arbiters of my professional and medical value, tolerating pain like a warrior when I profess to be an academic. The textbook presentation of appendicitis in non disabled patients is visibly excruciating pain, incoherence, a hampered gait. The expected presentation of fibromyalgia a pain amplification syndrome, is also visibly excruciating pain. Chronic pain and fatigue set a new context for understanding biomedical technology, like digital pathology and imaging, which expose the intimate invisible body to the naked eye to route out pain. In Western clinics, without conclusive medical images, like x-rays, MRIs, or CTs, to corroborate my subjective certainty, I am stranded alienated from clinicians who point to my, quote, clinically insignificant scans as incontrovertible evidence of normalcy. Diagnoses offered by imaging technologies transform our corporeal body minds into artifacts more legitimate than the spectral presence of FMS and MECFS, like charts, symptom and medication logs, images on light boards and screens, or physician notes. These forms of capture wield cultural and political forces, they prognosticate and influence medical decisions, even when they overwrite the patient's self-knowledge of her body with stereotypes or false interpretations to better align with clinical standards of chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and acute rupture. But my fibromyalgia, my appendicitis, my adhesion, all evade visualization. Any discussion of the machinic assemblages that capture my body's interior is predicated on ocular centrism and photography, whose technical, aesthetic, and social aspects influenced the emergence, spread, and acceptance of optical apparatuses in the clinic. Machine detection and rendering orders the diagnosis, legitimacy, and treatment of fibromyalgia. Physicians lose us in their visual field when they look at us too directly. When they capture us on film and crow over the achievement, they don't know what they have in their hands. They can't fathom the boom that simultaneously comes into focus and slips the trap of the biomedical gaze. I have privately called this missability, where miss is wrongness or inaccuracy, often stemming from the perceiver, but not the deficiency or lack signified by disabilities, dis. Self-definition is a compelling framework for the reclamation of the specialized knowledge of chronically pained non-white subjects who exist under intersecting oppressions, objectified in spaces that remain resistant to our reality as we tell it. Fluidity belongs in these categories, and in this act of naming, as a rejection of the binary thinking that characterizes so many Euro-Western definitions, and as an integration of the ambiguity that is fundamental to the affective life of Thummels and our personhood. Obliqueness, indirection, and intentional ambiguity 
are an integrated part of Thelma culture and enactments of self, found in metaphors and parables that free, rather than firmly fix, interpretive possibilities. An Ilum Thummel aesthetics of experience privileges expressions with a capacity to contain multiplicity, facilitating fluidity and ambiguity. This is embodied in fibromyalgic fascial cunning, a responsive somatic intelligence located in connective tissue, a kind of metis where mistakes constitute desirable action, and tactile habit leads to internal interconnection. Fucking up, or getting fucked up, is a kind of ambivalent prerequisite to this somatic cunning, imperative to its prophylactic habituations of pain, and to undoing these stuck postures. As fascia is undetectable on imaging scans, the biomedical gaze sees none of this. Hello, I'm Vaishali Manivanan, and I am a non-apparently disabled, queer, Ilum Thummel American creative critical scholar. I was diagnosed with chronic pain and chronic fatigue well before entering my doctoral program. During my coursework, I titrated on and off multiple medications. I had imaging scans, biopsies, weekly physical therapy. I strained my shoulder before my qualifying exams and did my oral defense with my arm in a sling. My appendix ruptured and was medically dismissed for months that year as well, and I spent the following academic year recovering from surgery, relearning how to eat and breathe, and aggressively treating the scar tissue with acupuncture. Through all this, I taught, did administrative work, and tutored to afford my health care, and rationed appointments and pills when I couldn't. I commuted to work, complied with academia's pressures, conformed to the disciplinary conventions of communication scholarship, cried over my throbbing gut in the bathrooms of Sky and Huntington House, and performed respectability politics by, quote, passing as able-body-minded. I began this program and my dissertation in a position of precarity some time ago, and while I obtained a full-time NTT position in 2018, I finished writing during a pandemic, self-isolating due to my high-risk status, my routine healthcare radically reduced, and my usual pain amplified tenfold. Mine is not the standard non-disabled graduate student trajectory, and this is not a standard five-chapter social science dissertation. I asked a lot of my committee, my advisor especially, as engaging with a project like this, particularly as it's being written, requires patience, an openness to novel forms, and faith that a nonlinear crip composition process will yield a coherent draft. My committee's support for an autoethnographic multimodal project like this, and for my disabled temporality and crip queer thumbal ways of thinking, is uncommon in doctoral programs. I'm lucky. I suspect I would not be completing my degree if it weren't for their endorsement of my work, accommodation of my neuroqueer composition practices, and frequent reassurance that there is, or should be, a space for interdisciplinary, creative, critical, digital dissertations like this. I arrived at this project in late 2014, as I recovered from an emergency appendectomy that compelled me to rethink my desires and needs as a student and scholar. Between teaching, resting, and rehabilitation, I tried to process what had happened to me, and the more I processed, the more I realized that my research interests had shifted to something more profoundly personal and lived, a set of experiences so common to me that I'd almost forgotten how uncommon they are to non-disabled white people. Having narratives imposed on me, having my patient scholar expertise undermined in the clinic on the grounds that I'm not a physician, that I have a, quote, hypochondriac diagnosis, that I'm a non-white, quote, well-appearing woman, having to suppress my misabled ways of knowing, being, and communicating to conform to the formats demanded by the clinic and the academy, having to perform my chronic illness into visibility to satisfy biomedicine's ocular-centric imperative, having to question the validity of my neuroqueer ways of knowledge and sense-making, having to insist that I am able to communicate about my pain, even when I am in pain, over and over, because I am typically disbelieved. The clinic wouldn't believe me, and the academy demanded a charade I could no longer keep up. That these two systems were mutually, even cooperatively, hell-bent on excluding body minds like mine, never seemed clearer to me, and with my recent brush with death, the stakes never felt higher. The ruptured appendix that almost killed me made it increasingly difficult for me to put the mask of normalcy back on, where I was writing a cybertext, instead of traditional academic work that harms me to produce, was relatively frictionless. For one, it allowed me to write in ways that mirror how I think and create, in interactive stories whose narratives I can pour over repetitively in search of another ending, 
in gardens of forking paths, whose logic is most apparent to me when their original labyrinthine structure remains intact. For another, it facilitated an immersive experience of the interruptions, boredom, frustration, and joyous revelation that accompany chronic pain. And finally, it allowed me to structure the project in a way that culturally aligned with my knowledge about pain. Once I decided that this project was autoethnographic, connecting the autobiographical to the social, cultural, and political, I knew that I wanted readers to work in the registers of fibromyalgia, fatigue, and fog to construct the story via consumption strategies that render the narrative unstable, unpredictable, and emergent, like hyperlinks, interruptive multimedia content, and interactive texts and paratextual materials. As my experience of pain is inseparable from my identity as an Ilum Thummel American with intergenerational trauma, I chose to code mesh, incorporating the Thummel phrases and terms I heard growing up and sometimes think in, to use parables like the ones that inform my knowledge making, and to structure the project like an ancient Thummel epic. As I think through and link my experience by traversing and retraversing it via multiple pathways, I wrote this with more pathways than I can anticipate. Each padalum or section is a standalone piece, thematically organized into condoms as well, so that readers can choose their own way forward to their frustration or relief. This is about the body, the mind, the academy, the clinic, time, and pain is a capacious title for a sprawling project. I see these items as inextricably intertwined for the chronically pained subject. It's difficult to pinpoint a single argument for such a project, which follows a broad set of choppy queries, such as, what can a body do? What language does it speak? Or what language is used to speak for it? How does the vulnerability and contingency of slash in my chronically pained body echo structural flaws in society and mass culture? How do mostly accepted alternative practices like body work, acupuncture, and body modification reconstitute the relationships between body and self, pain and personhood, and client and hands-on practitioner? And by experimenting with the sensory hierarchy, simulating contingency, and intervening with technology, how might we learn to differently and more expansively express and receive articulations of pain typically unrecognized by both medical technology and the untrained human eye? More specifically, each condom unpacks a particular relationship between discourses around the ailing body, biomedical technologies intended to render visible chronic pain, and the compulsory able-body-mindedness of academic culture and its writing conventions. Through analysis of discursive artifacts meant to define my post on the self, such as imaging reports, pharmaceutical rhetoric, self-monitoring technologies, and academic interchange, I aimed to show how techniques and institutions converge to bring the scholar in pain under the biomedical and academic gaze. Adi Kondom poses a set of research questions and double mythic frameworks and presents a visual novel about navigating chronic illness, symptom onset, and diagnosis as a graduate student. Bully Kundum examines the affective, rhetorical, and decolonial dimensions of fibromyalgia. It explores Western biomedical definitions and expectations of fibromyalgia, as well as intersubjective experiences of fibromyalgia, which are bounded in their expressions by taste and decency, and are more biocultural than biomedical. Padam Kundum asks what it means to be fibromyalgic in an ocular-centric matrix of standardized digital evaluations and technical interventions developed around the notion of pain as an acute, transient symptom and not a condition itself. It asks how measurement comes with morals, how imaging technologies recast the fibromyalgic body as a frontier to colonize and conquer, how the cryptic, chronically ill body unsettles and disperses medical expertise, how and from whom the world is given form. Illusio Condom conceptualizes academic work as a game with shifting investments using Bourdieu's concept of Illusio to explore the operation of symbolic violence on the chronically ill graduate student. The academy is a reproduction machine of class and cultural capital, promoting a specific kind of scholar, one with lightning recall, linear thought, a neutral style of writing, a collegial demeanor, respectable fashion, and a willingness to overextend and suffer in silence. The academic field trains its members to misrecognize a work ethos that perpetrates symbolic violence on all of its members, but especially the precariat, especially non-apparently disabled graduate students, who must cope with academic ableism on top of everything else. 
Missability Condom considers how to be a chronically ill, ill American with a cultural propensity for ambiguity and be biomedically categorized as disabled in a non-disabled slash disabled binary, as though there is no slippery third way of being. It unpacks the ambiguity inherent to non-apparent chronic pain and locates somatic cunning in the fascia as both fluidity and constant bracing, evasion and unmasking, myofascial release, and the irascible reformulations of the flesh in response to its environments and productivity imperatives. It proposes the term missability for the set of orientations, skills, and everyday and specialized knowledge born of non-white fibromyalgic standpoint and erased in biomedical diagnoses of disability, which is oriented around external systems of classificatory naming and visibilizing technologies that look for lack and deficiency. Niti Kade Kandam draws on the rich oral tradition in Tamil culture that legitimizes the epistemic value of lived experience and folklore alongside theoretical knowledge and scientific inquiry. All experiences are the potential basis of parables, and parables make meaning of past and future experience as argumentative investigative tools without denying my cultural identity. Parables advocate for learning through interpretation and reconciliation of meaning, not explicit theory and agonistic discourse, asking you to extract meaning from a story that may possess multiple interpretations. My late Appa taught me this, and taught me through parables when I was young. If things in the story represent something else, what is that something else? As with many chronic illnesses, fibromyalgia inspires in clinicians the attitude that this is incurable but must be cured. Parables inspire in acceptance, the disposition towards openness, patience, and decryption that is essential for living with fibromyalgia. Taken together, this project locates the chronically pained subject in a network of bodies in which fibromyalgic and non-disabled subjects exist interdependently, undermining how popular and institutional discourses frame pain as an unknowable, alienating, and individuating state, and chronic pain as involuntarity, a fate worse than death. By attending to the relationships between fibromyalgia and ocularity, particularly in the wake of digitization, it deconstructs individual moments in how the queer alumthamo fibromyalgic woman scholar is perceived and constructed as a failed body, medically and academically, and how she subverts or exploits those constructions. Ultimately, this project aims to emphasize the need to reconfigure fibromyalgic subjects as non-expendable people whose disability doesn't make impossible a dynamic, joyful, and desirable existence, and to replace biomedical logics of cure with the goals of the disability justice movement, care, access, and radical collective love. Thank you.